despite decades of improvement um, that dairy producers have made in improving cluster management, and they have, um, producers are to be commended for that, um, there's still a huge opportunity um, on the average farm to further improve cluster management. And it is one of the cornerstones of the Young Stock Management Program. If we don't get the colostrum program right, it's hard to recover that later through other things. So it, it's still something we really need to focus on. Welcome to the Dairy Health Black Belt Podcast. I'm Luciano Cacheta. I'm Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota. And today I have the pleasure to actually be uh, uh, having a conversation with my colleague, who we actually share a wall. Our offices are next to each other. Uh, we have, uh, today we have the pleasure to have Dr. Sandra Godin as our guest. And in this podcast, we'll be discussing uh, a topic that is very uh, near and dear to her heart and something that she has been leading for many years, which is uh, colostrum management and uh, providing the best colostrum we can for for our calves. So welcome, Sandra. Thank you, Luciana. It's a pleasure to be here. Like I said, I have the pleasure to share a wall with you in the, in the office. And like anytime I have questions about colostrum, uh, I, I come to you. Um, so it's good to have you here. And you have been working on this, have developed a lot of protocols, a lot of like you are certainly a reference for the field on this, uh, this topic. Uh, and let's start with something basics, like why, why colostrum management, management is so important for the cats? Um, despite decades of improvement um, that dairy producers have made in improving colostrum management, and they have, um, producers are to be commended for that. Um, there's still a huge opportunity um, on the average farm to further improve cluster management. And it is one of the cornerstones of the Young Stock Management Program. If we don't get the colostrum program right, it's hard to recover that later through other things. So it, it's still something we really need to focus on. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. now that's good. And like through the years that we all see and we have discussions and we're trying to create uh, materials and ways to make it easier for people to understand and to really nail down the importance of it, right? So uh, there is many people have might have heard, but there's like the five cues that we would talk about colostrum management. So what are those those five cues that we need to? Yeah, well, it started out with three cues, quality, so IgG concentration in the colostrum we feed, quantity, the volume that we provide at the first feeding, and quickness, how quickly we get it into the calf after birth. And those are still the mainstays if we have to get those things right. But we've added two new cues in the last several years, I guess. One is um, quantifying or monitoring our program, so bleeding calves and checking serum total proteins um, regularly to make sure the program is working. But the fifth cue um, that is relatively new is is that well, it's cleanliness, which is a C, but um, we are going to call it squeaky clean. So we're looking at the bacterial concentrations in the colostrum that is fed, and we've learned in the last decade or a little bit more now um, that the cleanliness of the colostrum that we feed is very, very important. So we're focusing on cleaning that up on a lot of dairies as well. Okay. Oh, that, that's that's important, and like I think it goes in a way it goes with everything that we do at a farm, right? Like we need to be uh, clean. That always makes it for better. Uh, outcomes uh, and uh, like and you mentioned like feeding this clean colostrum uh, is there are some benchmarks or some measurements that we should take uh, to to account for that yeah you bet the simplest thing to do would just be to take some mastitis sample tubes and collect three four five um, colostrum samples as you are about to feed them to the calf label them date them freeze them and then have your local clinic um, or your local reference lab culture them. We'll just do a simple total plate count or a total coliform count. It doesn't need to be a fancy um, 
speciated culture. And um, if it's raw or fresh colostrum that we're feeding, we want the total plate count to be less than 100,000 colony forming units per milliliter. If we're actually heat treating the colostrum on the farm, then we expect it to be much cleaner again, the goal being a total plate count of less than 20,000. CFUs per mil. Yeah, so that, that's those are good numbers, good benchmark for people that you know. And so, so why is it that why is it so important? Because we had discussions, and the other the other elements have been, as you mentioned, like here, and we have discussing for more deck more time, and these are newer elements. So, so why is it important, and how can we uh, can we meaning producers work to have as clean as possible colostrum? Well, it's important for two reasons. I'll start with that question. The first reason is if the bacteria, if we've got high bacteria levels in colostrum, and if those bacteria happen to be pathogens like E. coli or salmonella or mycoplasma, things that cause disease in calves, then we are going to see more disease in calves. And uh, for example, if there are a couple of studies now with uh, total plate counts greater than 100,000 CFUs per mil, we see more scours in calves. So we don't want to be feeding pathogenic bacteria or viruses or other, other things to calves. The second reason is high levels of bacteria in colostrum somehow interfere with passive absorption of antibodies across the gut. So if we have high levels of cold forms in the colostrum, we see lower antibody absorption, <clears throat> excuse me, absorption, and consequently lower serum IgG levels in the calves or serum total protein levels in the calves when we test them. And we know that puts them at greater risk of disease as well. So the concern is, is for those two reasons. So your question was, well, um, let's say a producer does some cultures and counts are too high and you want to clean things up. Then there are three different places we look um, critical control points, if you will, to see where where bacteria may be introduced into the system and how we can clean things up. The first would be from the cow herself. So um, maybe she's shedding, she's infected with something and she's shedding it from the gland. But more commonly, probably she's got manure on the teeth skin. And if we don't do a good job prepping, cleaning and sanitizing that udder prior to harvest, we will wash uh, bacteria into the milking bucket with the colostrum. So coming from the cow, that's the first place. The second place, and this is really common, is that we have dirty equipment. Uh, we, we don't have adequate sanitation and cleaning of the equipment that we use to harvest, to store, or to feed the colostrum. So looking at your cleaning and sanitation protocols for all of that equipment is critical. And then the third place uh, bacteria can kind of get introduced is if we have uh, bacterial growth or proliferation in colostrum after it's been harvested. So it's stored under warm conditions, let's say, for too long and bacteria start to multiply, then we can get really, really high levels there. So we want to look at the question, uh, should we store colostrum after harvest or do we just want to feed it straight away? Um, but a lot of producers, excuse me, a lot of producers do want to store it. So getting it refrigerated as quickly as possible, chilling it down as quickly as possible, so we don't let the bugs have time to grow, but even then using it up within a couple of days or freezing it. And then you've got at least six months um, in storage before you can you know, thaw and feed it. So those are the three main critical control points for harvesting clean colostrum. Well, that, that's good, especially because we know that sometimes farms don't have access to that colostrum, right? Like we we hear all, oftentimes that they're, they're doing fine. They have colostrum for all the calves that eventually they don't have. So like if they have good, clean colostrum stored, they'll help them uh, in the future. I just want to circle back a little bit just to be clear to the, the, the listeners. Uh, you mentioned like the clean colostrum and the, the bacteria or the virus that we have there. You don't want to like be feeding that. And like even if they are not pathogenic, or the, the pathogens that we usually see with the, the diarrheas and the uh, other issues they have, they might be also contributing to the problems because they might be in, in layman terms, like taking place of and decreasing that IgG absorption, right? So it's not that we are, even if people are feeding in the, the pathogens or the bacteria there, it's not exactly the one, they still will influence the overall health of the calf. And I should mention, um, yeah, beyond those three 
management areas. I talked about the critical control points, uh, the, the harvest, the cleanliness of the equipment and storage conditions. Um, I should mention there are a couple of extra um, management strategies producers can adopt. They could heat treat colostrum on the farm. That can be very successful. Or you could use colostrum replacers, powdered colostrum, basically. Um, either one of those two strategies is yet another way of, of presenting the calf with clean antibodies, clean colostrum. Yeah, we're, we're coming up at the, at the time limit or the, the amount of time that we want for, for a podcast like this one. But there's a lot of different questions that can be asked about colostrum and colostrum management. And I just want to have your quick take before we go uh, on a topic that is very, very active and, and very evoked these days, which is the prolonged feeding of calves with colostrum for more. Like we, we talked here about be quick, right? And doing that in a timely manner after birth. And I think many farm, most farms are very good about it. But now we're seeing more like we use it more like for a longer time that might be also beneficial. What, what's your quick take on that? Yes. If, if it's practical to implement extended feeding of the transition milk, colostrum or transition milk for a second feeding, a third feeding, up to a third day, even up to two or three weeks feeding transition milk, um, we know that after 24 hours, the antibodies will no longer be absorbed into the blood of the calf because the gut has closed. However, there are still benefits locally in the gut to providing extended feeding. And so if we can do that, we will see things like improved rate of gain, improved gut development, um, reduced scours, um, reduce mortality and reduce antibiotic use. I'm trying to remember all of the benefits. But there are a lot of different benefits. So if it is practical for a farm to implement a second or third feeding of transition milk or incorporate the transition milk into the pooled uh, pasteurized whole milk feeding system that goes to calves for two or three weeks, there are definitely long-term benefits to that as well. Well, thank you, Dr. Godin, for your time. I wish we had more time. There's, like we discussed, a lot of more questions and a lot more things to, to learn and continue investigate and making it better for the cows. But this will conclude today's episode. Uh, thank you for participating. My pleasure. Thanks, Luciana. So this is it for today. Uh, this is it for uh, today's Dairy, Dairy Health Black Belt podcast. I'm Luciano Cacheta from University of Minnesota. And if you like this episode and if you like what we'll be presenting, please like the, the pages, uh, send us feedback, let us know, comment uh, on comments what you like to hear. We'll make sure that we can uh, address all those topics that people are interested. We want to bring you the, the most relevant and the newest uh, information that we have in the dairy industry. Uh, this is it for me today. Uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.